I'm, I'm ready. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to you. What's going on? So I'm gonna go ahead and start because I got a lot of information to cover with you guys and I hope we can cover it all in this hour. <laughs> if not, um, couple of things about this presentation before we get started. The majority of the images we're about to see were um, purchased and given to me through Back National many years ago, and also that would mean Merlin Tuttle. If you're not familiar with Tuttle, he was the original founder of Back Conservation International. They do a lot of work, a lot of conservation work, had the privilege of working with bats and in and around buildings because in about 2003 from a school district in central Texas and it was a brand new elementary school and they informed me that but I'll get back to you because that's my job is I'm supposed to help you with your IPM program from there I literally have learned lots about bats um, they are very fascinating creatures they're one of the most amazing. Species of bats and they are everywhere but the Arctic regions and that's including Arctic and Antarctica. So those are the two polar regions. That's the only place that they're not found, but everywhere else in the world they are. They typically like warm climate areas. So if I was to show you, I'd say right here in the middle along the equator, but they do go all the way up to the northern reaches and all the way down here to the southern reaches. So bats are worldwide. If you were looking at mammals across the world, one in five are considered bats. You don't see as probably not, and everybody thinks, you know, the world is being run over by rats, but truthfully, bats make up the most mammals worldwide. So let's separate some fact from fiction, because a lot of people have some interesting myths and beliefs about bats. One of the most interesting bats is their ability to fly using what we call true power. By that is, if you watch a bird, a bird will launch before they fly. Whereas a bat, one, they cannot walk, so birds sometimes will hop around do that. Sometimes they will crawl around, especially the larger bats, but most bats have, the reason they hang upside down is so that they can achieve that true flight. This is important when you're understanding bat behavior, because if you don't understand this basic biological need, everything else gets skewed. The other one is most bats only give birth to one young, Whereas there are some species, and they're very, very limited, do birth twins. So in other words, this is somewhat like human in that generally we're, we're only giving birth to one human. Multiples are very rare. It's the same with bats. They can live long lives. In other words, if you were to compare them to like rodents, rodents are known to live for only a couple of years. Bats there is a pair of fox bats that has been adopted by BCI, and I believe the last time I checked, they were either 39 or 40 years old, so that that gives you an idea. Again, 47 species in the United States. Some states have more than others. They do carefully groom themselves. The reason, again, this is extremely important to know about their biology is, again, what can and can't be done, why you don't use chemicals around them, and other important factors. And then 
We've now know that the oldest bat, bat fossil is over 50 million years ago, but they are finding um, it may be going back even further. Everybody thinks bats are blind. No, they're not. They use echolocation, which means they use sound more than they use sight to find either their food or where they're roosting. People believe that if a bat falls and gets in, falls, it will get in your hair. No, not unless you put it there. And are bats all vampires? This is a big thing right now because there is talk about a specific vampire bat that is known to live in Mexico coming across the US-Mexico border. Granted, that bat only feeds on um, cattle, but it is a concern. They don't feed on humans. My favorite myth, bats are flying rats. No, they're not. You can ask me on a sideline what I refer to as the flying rat, and all bats have rabies. We're going to cover rabies, but basically, if you, if you have to dive out early, no, they don't. One half of 1% of a large colony, and we're talking hundreds of thousands of bats. So if you're talking a hundred and thousands of bats, one half of 1%, you're talking, you know, very small numbers. So no, all bats don't have rabies. Bats are beneficial. They are the most beneficial mammal we have on the planet because of what they do. Since they are, majority of them are insectivores, they can capture prey in flight. Well, what does this mean? That means they're ca catching coddling moss and other flying insects that attack agricultural crops. They're relatively small sized, again, and again, we definitely use these pests. I know of uh, apple orchard that they only use purple martens and bats as their pest control because they can eat all the insects. We do have some flower feeding bats. If you are a tequila drinker, then you definitely want the long nose bat because they are the ones that pollinate the agave plant. But we don't have that many in the US. So this is where we start talking about, because when I get phone calls and when people are wondering what to do, and it doesn't matter if it's myself or they're calling our Department of State Health Services or our Parks and Wildlife, or our master gardeners at our county extension offices, people wanna know where they live. Well, there's not that many caves, especially in the Southern US, so they find other structures to live for. Now, what's very interesting about bats, and this is something, again, that a lot of people don't consider is bats roost in the same place year after year after year. So if bats aren't known to to live and roost in your area, there's a chance that they're not going to come to a bat house if they don't know that this is a place for them to live. This is also why there is problems when a stand of trees is taken down and a building structure is put in its place because the bats were used to going and roosting in trees and now there's a structure there as well. So the first place, and some of you may be very familiar with these images on the left, that is the Congress Avenue Bridge in Austin, Texas. This is where Merlin Tuttle really put bat conservation on the map because what happened was our Texas Department of Transportation put this bridge up. And as you can see in this top right image, you see these little cracks right here. Well, all of these cracks are where bats are actually roosting. That is what that staining is. That is what all that is. And this black down here is guano. But that's where the bats live, and that's where they come back. And that's what you're seeing over here in this left corner of them emerging out from underneath this, this bridge. Well, not every bridge is designed for bats. There are also culverts or other structures underneath sometimes of highways and stuff where bats roost. This is a common culvert down, um, it's actually leaving San Antonio going towards Corpus. And as you can see, you can see down this culvert, it looks like there's nothing there. And then you get really close up and you can see in some of the holes where the bats are roosting. So this is very, very common. Caves? All right, well, this 
and I pulled this one off of the internet, but this is Bracken Crate, Bracken Crate, Bracken Cave, which is again outside of San Antonio, Texas. This is where our bats were known to roost for so many decades. And like I said, now they're in bridges and homes and buildings. But this is what they look like when you see them in a cave. And this is important for, again, for everybody to understand because when you notice how bats live, Notice how close everybody is to one another. They're, again, not, sorry about that, folks. They're not separate. They're all stacked up. You have a few that are separate, but typically they are going to roost on top of each other. Man-made structures. So this is how I got involved with bats because, all right, it's one thing the bats are in an abandoned home, building, barn. It's another, and this is someone's really home. Yes, that dark staining up here is bats. That is from bats coming in. That is from bats coming in. I mean, this is types of things that as you're looking at structures, and this is how bad I do my job, or how good I do my job, is everywhere I go, I'm constantly looking for black staining or other evidence of some type of mammal living next to a structure because all mammals have what we call sebum as long as humans do and that sebum is grease and we actually we all rub it off so types of bat habitats i threw in this image from fly by night because i thought it was a really good image that she shared with me years ago because what this shows you is here is one of their favorite places to live in the south it's called the palm tree Colorado, I don't think y'all got any of those. Um, the second favorite place would be underneath this soffit or eaves because all of these little openings, if it's the size of a thumb, they can get in. Well, here's their alternative roost, their bat house. The reason I show this image is, is when I'm trying to explain to somebody, where do you put a bat house? You put it as close as to where they were living in a structure and or a tree. Because if you don't, they're not going to know where to go to. They're not gonna go three miles looking for this house. So if it's a solitary bat species, and I'm gonna talk briefly about them later, generally it's mom and her pups. They do mate for life. It could be the mom and the male, but once the pups leave, but it's generally a small family unit. They prefer um, barks, they prefer trees. They don't generally live Solitary species don't live in bad houses and solitary species generally don't invade a building. Every now and then that happens, but it's not as common. However, when we look at colonial bat species, these are social. If you were to think bees, um, ants, cockroaches, any of our social insects that we've talked about in these webinar series, bats are very similar. In other words, they have a social structure it's multiple. Now, granted, they don't have a queen, they don't have anything like that, but they do tend to live in large familial groups. Again, they prefer natural locations, but they have learned to adapt and adapt well because they have, they live in every structure. I have seen them any, go anywhere into um, chimneys, buildings, courthouses, homes, like I said, bridges, you name it. If they can find a way in, they will move in. So let's talk about hibernation and how they live during what we refer to as the cool months. Because bats can hibernate and slow down their heart rate to where they can live in cooler, colder areas and over the winter months. Generally in the south, they don't. We refer to that as torpor because what ends up happening is, is because these bats use, consume a lot of energy when they are out. So if you think about this, they leave their nest at night and they're going to go out and they're going to forage for food. The majority of what they're doing when they're foraging for food is flying. It's not like they're getting to sit down and take a rest. They will, they will take a rest at some point, but generally it is not like what we think when we think rest. So that's the first part. So hibernation means they go 
and they slow down during a cool period. What ends up happening, and this is very common in the South, is we'll get a cold front come in, and I'm going to pick on Texas because this is my home state. But in Texas, especially in North Texas, Dallas area, and I see it all the way down to, to the Houston area, we will get cold weather coming in December and January. And it will get cold, it will get down to 30 degrees, and you know, everything shuts down. So the bats go into hibernation. Well, we'll get a warm front sometime in possibly January, February, it starts to warm up and we'll get days to where it's 70 degrees. Well, once it warms up, they wake up. And that's that torpor part. Well, that's when they wake up and they think, oh, I'm hungry. I need to go out and feed. Well, what ends up happening is they go out and they feed and then it gets cold and sometimes they're caught outside. And this is where you, the public, actually see them and are concerned. This is all part of that life cycle. They just don't understand that our weather is wacky. And, I'm, and I don't think we can ever explain that to them. So migration. It was believed, and I will be very, very honest with y'all, when I first started talking and looking into this and learning about Mexican free tails, oh yeah, and I'm gonna show you this map. They're down here and they're, they reside and they'll migrate up and then they'll come back down. Well, this is actually a map of what's called a hoary bat. And this is one of the more solitary bats, but it does, it is seen a lot across the U.S. Well, if you notice, the hoary bat's permanent residence is down here in South America. And then it's also in Central America. Well, they fly north to breed and migrate north to feed and then come back down. We see a lot of this, especially in the western part of the, the state of Texas, with these bats actually dropping in. But a lot of people don't realize that. We thought for sure all Mexican free tail bats all migrated. They all came from the mountains of Mexico. They followed the coddling moss and migrated north and then came back south. Well, we've learned there's a species in Texas, thanks to the Texas A&M Parks and Wildlife and BCI, that Mexican free tails don't migrate. If they migrate anywhere, they might migrate from here up to Houston, but they do not migrate in long distances. They have now become permanent residences of Texas. I thought I'd throw this image in because this is one of those stellar images the first time it happened that even the weather people were like, what the heck? Because can you imagine looking at your Doppler radar and you see all this red and you know that there's no storm coming? This is all bats. These are from two different caves, one of them being Bracken Cave, the other one being up in Kamal. And literally the bats are emerging and they're catching them on Doppler radar. So it is a phenomenon and it can happen. So let's talk about common roosting species. If you want, you can click on this web link and you too can go there and find it. Or if you go to www.batcon.org, you can go into their website. They have a lot of resources on bats and buildings and what signs of roosting are because this is important for you to know, especially if you're trying to figure out if you've got bats in your home. So the first brat we're going to talk about is the big brown bat. Now, I've got asterisks, and the reason I have asterisks, these little asterisks, means that if I've denoted it with an asterisk, it means that they have been tested positive for rabies. And really, I'm getting my information mostly from Texas because I have access to our Texas rabies reports. But again, this is a large colony, as you can see up here. This is one of our larger bats. It's several inches long. Um, you can see it with the naked eye. It is known to live everywhere in the United States. Every, every state has got them. They're more prevalent in the north than they are in the south. And I'm not entirely sure if that's because of body size, caves, or whatever. But again, they are very, very common bat. 
The next one is called the little brown myotis, or others have called it the little brown bat. Again, this is another very popular bat. It lives almost entirely in the U.S. Believe it or not, Texas is one of the few states that it doesn't always roost in. Um, but this one also feeds near water. This is one of the few bats that will eat mosquitoes. I know everybody thinks that all bats eat mosquitoes. Some bats don't think mosquitoes are worth their effort because there's no meat on their bones. This is a bat that will live in bat houses. But the other thing that we have definitely noticed about this particular species of bat, and there is a lot of concern, and it's this last bullet, is it has been heavily impacted by white nose syndrome. I will speak a little bit about that in a little bit, but I do want you guys to understand that this is one of the bats that has been impacted by white nose. This bat, the Mexican free tail bat, or some call it the Brazilian free tail bat, is, I mean, a number one bat in Texas. It's the number one bat in Florida. This is the most common bat in the South. Again, it is comes in contact with humans because it lives around humans. When they live in the bridges, when they live in buildings, when they live close to humans, you're going to see something that lives close to you. In other words, we don't see big brown bats because they don't generally live closer to humans as much as the Mexican free tails. Again, 100 million free tail bats living in central Texas caves can consume over a thousand tons of insects at night. It really has, there's some great research on this. If you were to even Google bats as beneficial, there you'll find some of the research studies that are out there that BCI has done, that University of Tennessee has done, University of Texas has done. The evening bat. Now, this one is because they're one of the first bit bats that comes out at night. I've actually seen this bat um, out in East Texas myself. They do form the maternity colony. Yes, they tend to live close to water. So again, they generally roost in trees, but they can be seen around streetlights. This is one of the ones you get calls at. People see them flying around streetlights. They will um, occupy a bat house as long as you put the bat house again close to where they might have been living. And again, the designation is we have seen these bats um, with rabies. The cave myotis. This one is one that a lot of don't see usually because Again, it does live in canes or caves, canes, caves, abandoned mines, um, buildings, under bridges. They're not as common as bridge dwellers as the Mexican free tail, but again, as their colonies swell and they have limited places to live, because they are small, they can live in those bridge cracks. Um, what is very interesting about this this particular bat species is they have been known to roost with other bats. In other words, in a large building, they have been known to find colonies of cave myotis and Mexican free tails, which is extremely interesting. Now, what's really interesting is what this bat eats. It's food, again, small flying insects, but weevils, um, small beetles, and flying ants, those are not something that every bat will eat. So this is a very beneficial bat because of what the pests it will eat. The silver hair bat, okay, this is another one. Right now, it's mostly found in forest areas. It prefers, again, you know, dense trees, um, lots of deciduous forest trees. It needs forest growth to really be happy. It may live in um, cavities or bit, buildings, but it's not known to roost around man. Again, this is another one that eats small insects, and we've not noticed any diseases attributed to it, but that doesn't mean that it's not out there. It just means I couldn't find a recent study on it. The hoary bat. Now, personally, I think this is one of the cutest bats out there, and it's just a Janet Hurley personal thing. I just think that they're just the cutest bats out there, but that's just a personal thing. They do um, reach their peak activity about five hours after sunset. They are nocturnal. So in other words, what this really means is 
This is one of the few bats you don't see early in the evening. They come out later. So generally they will come out after full dark, whereas the Mexican free tails, the brown bats, and the evening bats, a lot of those bats will come out as the sun is setting and the, the dusk and dawn flyers are out. These bats actually come out later at night and feed on insects that are out during the nighttime hours. The tricolored bat, which used to be, and I put this in here specifically, called the Eastern Pipistrelle. Nothing like the scientific community changing names on people, and this, is, this happens in, I put this up for the entomologists in the group, we're not the only ones that change names. But again, the tricolored bat, the, the pipistrel, the perimyotis, again, one of the first ones to come out at night, but it's also one of the first ones to go into hibernation. Again, they come out early, they are short. In other words, they don't travel long range. The brown bats, little and large, the Mexican free tail, and several of the other species can travel upwards of thousands of miles. Okay, they can go hundreds of miles at night. This particular bat, no it can't. It's loyal to their hibernation spa space, it's loyal to its area, and yes, because of its loyalty, it is one of the ones that has been Im impacted by white nose syndrome. So, moving along and living with bats. How do you exclude them from human areas and then how do you build bat houses? So a lot of the images I'm going to show you from this point forward are either schematics or some of the images are images I have from my own or I've been able to pull. The reason I pulled this particular image is it had a couple of features that a lot of people may or may not think, oh, well, this is conducive for bats. You've got ridges here on a roof. Ridges on a roof and any openings it, that are the size of a dime or larger. Well, if a bat can land here and crab walk in and can get into a roof and then fly out, then they're in and they'll invite all of their family. You've got openings like this. You know, if I was doing this and this was rodents, it'd be no different. It's just a matter of how can they they can't fly directly in, but they will, they can land and then crab walk in. If you have a colony of bats in a house or a public building, CDC recommends, and this is bat conservation and generally public health, you need to do exclusion, which means disinfest. Bats are removed and excluded from a facility. Disinfest. Is there guano buildup and does that need to be removed? Those are two things that we're going to consider next. So exclusion. There is no chemical out there. If anybody tells you any differently, if you see it on YouTube, they're lying. There is no such thing as a baticide. There is no chemical that you can use. Mothballs are illegal. Okay, spraying bleach on them is illegal. If you need to remove bats from a structure, they must be excluded. This diagram and the links that I have put in this, this PowerPoint is designed to show you. So if you've got bats roosting, you would have a hole. Typically, you've already got the hole. You wouldn't have to cut a hole. You would stick something like a cock tube or PVC pipe and you would let the bats come out and seal everywhere else. You can use fabric netting, but I'm going to show you some images that will possibly discourage you from using this because we've had some problems with netting in the past. But we've got to talk about what you do because the bats have got to be excluded. So let's first talk about where do bats come in. Chimneys are a wonderful place for not just bats, just so you all know, my favorite foe in my chimney are swifts. So if you've got chimney swifts, they will tend to, to move in just like bats. They can come in under soffits. The grates at your um, gable vents, those are perfect opportunities to allow 
bats in. I have seen them come in underneath gutters, downspouts, loose shingles. If you've got a tile roof, those are just perfect for bats. And then my all-time favorite is when the custodial staff is cleaning up after a night event, they have the dock doors open. Well, Sir Bat will follow Sir Moth, and as they're chasing the moth for dinner, they'll fly into a, a structure. They go in, somebody closes the door, they're stuck in the building, and the next morning you hear this screeching bat because they got stuck in. Typically, if you'll just open the dock door, and they're not on the ground, they will fly back out, just give them time. So following these steps, you have to identify areas of entry. Generally, I tell people this is going to be done during early evening and early morning. And the reason I say that is, and it's happened more than once, bats will leave a building on one side and they will enter on another side. They choose the path of least resistance. And it's hard to explain that even in a vi vi visual like this because I can't give you everything that is if I was standing with you and going over this. But as you can see this opening right here and this bottom image and this opening right here, you see this black staining? That black staining is from bats that land and then crab walk up in and then drop into this attic space. If they used a device like this to allow them to come out, a device like this, this bat excluder, does not allow them because they can't just land on this and then crawl back into the tube. They would have to land on a wall. Well, they're not gonna land on the wall and then walk out here and crawl in. They just won't do it. So that's why when we tell you, when you're doing your exclusion, you've got to put a device like this so that they can crawl out. We also recommend leaving devices. Five to seven days is average in warm weather. If it is cool weather, it's definitely longer. And then I'm going to also talk about what you're going to be doing during the summer because most of you aren't going to be doing exclusion during the summer times. So bat management and netting. There is some fabric netting, which is like this, and this is a poly, polyurethane type netting. The difference between the two is sometimes this, this fabric netting, the bats will actually get stuck on the netting and then they're left stuck there squealing. I will tell you there's not a lot of homeowners that will allow for any type of squealing. So this is why bat conservation and a lot of other um, rehab organizations discourage the netting because, because the bats can get stuck and it becomes, it becomes stressful on you, the person who doesn't want the bats in your home and the bats themselves. So using exclusion one-way cones, you can make your own. I've actually seen maintenance guys make them out of hardware cloth. You can pick up these plastic ones. You can find these all on the internet. Or you can use, and there is actually instructions on the Bat Conservation website, where you can use caulk tubes. You know, instead of sending the empty caulk tube to the landfill, you can actually clean out the caulk, cut them, um, nail them to the side of your home and then use those as eviction devices. Notice my last statement. Do not exclude during summer months when babies are around, May to August, let them fly. What this actually means is right now we are in main mating and birthing season. The bats mated probably late uh, depending on where you're at in the country and now they are producing their young young or if you want to think puppy or kitty it takes them six to eight weeks for them to be so it takes them a while moms go out fly at night get their their meals they come back in and then they actually feed their young so the reason we made August let them fly is 
if the young are in your structure, you seal them in there, you're going to seal them in there. They won't be able to. So just think of that. Management. So think of this if you had louvers like. Bats, and let me tell you, rats and birds will also not move in. You put something like a chimney cap on top of your chimney or, you know, old smoke. This is extremely important, especially if it's metal or aluminum. Metal and aluminum in our hot heats in the south literally will um, warp and allow Talk about guano. Guano is a great natural fertilizer, but it also can be hazardous. And the reason accumulations in the right conditions, so it's got to have the right um, moisture content and everything, can cause um, histoplasmosis to form. But really, what we're more with guano is its buildup. The weight it can, can cause on a root. Bring in other parasites and other things, mites, fleas, bat bugs, or that can actually thrive off of the guano. So cleaning this up does require some major So let's talk about a little bit about histoplasmosis. Okay, again, about this guano buildup, it's kind of like a, a mild form of the flu. But again, I, I joke when we do our trainings and stuff that there is so much was I and what could I have been exposed to? But there's some other things. There's joint and muscle pain that goes with plasmosis there's chills there's hoarseness it's like case of the flu and then some so again if you're not sure talk with a with a medical physician if you think you might have that thing is understanding that guano can also trigger asthma and allergen so again mold spores that trigger all bats have rabies so literally, I don't know if anybody out there has had this happen in your community. This was literally a couple of years ago, which I kind of chuckle because we're not the back capital of Texas. You know, anywhere where you see these yellow dots, these are actually the laboratory confirmed of bats in But the rabies would be down here. But again, Everybody, and I saw a lot earlier this year, schools closing down because they all presumed all bats have rabies. For those of you in public health or dealing with the public, this is one of the that you need to have in your arsenal. I have literally left it right here. You can click. Brochure. It is now a multi-page document because we have learned a lot. But we've also learned that bats, since they are considered a high-risk rabies vector, humans don't have human exposure. But we know enough to where bats can exist. We do training in Texas where we call living with bats and avoiding rabies. It's a hundred percent possible to have bats roosting near you and not don't go and hang out and hold the bat. Bat bite appearance. As you can see, yes they have sharp but when it bites you, you may or may not know you've been bit. And I have got pictures of bats 
know, holes where people have gone in and reached in something. And we tell everybody at rehabber who has got rabies vaccines will tell So if you don't know you've been bit or you've been touched by, by a bat, that's why you go through a series of questions to determine, do you need, do you fall in the category of, you can't just look at a bat and say, oh, it's rabid. I mean, there are people that can because of the years and years of looking at them. But again, even looking at the Congress Avenue colony of bats, bat conservation just can't pick a rabid bat out of the sky. They don't have some of the telltale signs like skunks and raccoons do. So, when you don't touch them, Granted, he, you've got a dog, you've got a hunting dog, and it goes and it rat and it chews on it. My recommendation for you is if you can get them to drop it. Use um, your Walmart sack or something else. Because again, you don't want to. Because again, if you have to, rabies vaccines after exposure expensive. I know because I had a co-worker have post as it's generally not covered by insurance. So what does rabid bat behavior look like? Well why would a bat be on the ground? Prey or hawks? Typically it's hawks, hawks and snakes. Well, if a hawk goes to ground and it does, it's not successful, yes, that bat can fall on the ground and then it's grounded. And like I said, they're not just gonna get away. The other reason sometimes they're on the ground and walking behavioral strange is because they are rabid. Other things that you can notice teeth and dirt in their mouth or, or in their teeth. They're isolated from the colony. That large colony knows when there's a bat, a rabid bat, and they shun them. Yes, they do know. So again, that might be it. They may have that spastic paralysis that you definitely see when you see a rabid raccoon or a rabid skunk. But again, not everyone will see it, and it all depends on where the bat is in its rabies progression. And this is relatively new. If you look at it, the first bat that was diagnosed, discovered with this was in 2007. This is 2019. Disease, a new fungal disease because we're not sure a, where it came from. We really don't. There, there's some hypotheses, but they're really still struggling with that. They know that it grows on, fung on the skin tissue. Therefore, what happens is it's, it grows while hibernating because it grows during those cooler temperatures. In other words, white nose diseases that grows when it's cool. 33 states and seven provinces have found bats positive for this disease. That is what has been disturbing. There's 50 states and now we're over half of the states that have found bats with white nose syndrome. To illustrate, this is what we have seen. And um, But as you can see, it's very concentrated. East Coast, right here, where I'm pointing right now, that was ground zero. And then, as you can see, it actually my It keeps going. 
This is the concern. How is West Nile spread? I mean, West Nile, sorry. White nose syndrome, because everyone has, I always want to say West Nile virus, but it is white nose syndrome from bat to bat. It's believed it's transmitted primarily from the bat to bat and bat to cave. In other words, a fungal spore, they're going and hanging. They pick it up, they get it on their, their fur. And remember when I was saying that they groom each other? That is actually how it spread. So the substrate, the can survive in sediments, it can infect. Scientists have demonstrated that it may be caves that they originally found in like from 2008 to 2010. There, they started putting these signs up and telling people that they needed to go in and be careful what they were bringing in. But as humans, if we're actually transmitting this fungus in, well, then what we're doing is we're bringing the disease to them. So why do we need to help bats? As I stated in the beginning, are beneficial. They are the most beneficial mammal on the planet because of what they do for us. They help reduce insect populations. They help pollinate. They are extremely beneficial. However, they are susceptible to decline in it because their habitats are going away. There are new diseases coming out. And again, it's good for all the master gardeners and master naturalists that are on this call listening because you can help with bad education. So what do we do? Educate others about the community that you know that bats are prevalent. Help with periodic reminders. Don't touch a bat. All bats carry rabies. Make sure people, if for any of y'all in counties, make sure your county and others understand in the courthouse about bats because bats all think our courthouses are the second greatest place to stay next to the schoolhouses. While most of us think, oh, this tree's dying and it's no good thing, that tree hollow is a great place for a colony of bats to live. This great place for bats to live as well. So these destroyed in a forest fire, destroying old growth, bats as well. Encouraging bat the exclusion. Like I said, this is the netting that will drive any bat re absolutely crazy because again, the bats get caught, they screech, there's a problem, pretty leaving it open and just letting the bats coming in and out of this this home they're going to just go right back in if you don't exclude exclude have an eviction tube right here the bats will just move in they'll just go to the next place so we've seen this on school buildings they'll exclude the place where they were coming in the first time and the bats go to the back side of the school building and start moving in Creating artificial roofs. So the Raffinique's big ear bat, which is um, considered not endangered, but threatened. A concrete structure like this, and literally to mimic a hollow tree, that is how they come in. They can close it off so nothing, openings can allow the bats to actually move in. So they've, they've got different ways. But this is how they have done in um, Big Bend National Forest, actually, or Big Bend National Park, actually put this in. And there are other places, like I said, North Carolina, Georgia, and Florida have got them. Artificial bark for bats? Artificial bark for bats? Actually, Tom Flynn, who I'll thank later, 
but he's the brave man climbing up a ladder to actually put this up in a tree because it's got to be 20 feet or higher for the bats to act. Building and installing bat houses. Now, let me just right now this link, while it just says batcon.org, it really actually their full um, link on how to build a bat house. So they have specific instructions. you chatted in about this why am I having problems with bats coming in to my bat house and I'm going to tell you because I've seen this in person it's how so let's look so here's your bat house if you look at your bat house and these are not vented going horizontally and and in going vertically, then the bats aren't going to move in. And I have seen those bat houses where are not on the vertical edge. They have got to run so that they match the front panel. So if you think, let me go backwards. If you think, see how this, you've got this opening, you've got this opening, and you've got this opening. These all being large brown bats. For Mexican free tail, the opening would be a little bit skinnier. Again, quarter. An inch or a little bit larger. So you want to make sure. Do you have it high enough? That is the other thing. Most people don't put these 20 feet or higher. Remember, capable of free flight. They have got to be able to come out of out and sit out here like the birds do and then think about flying out. No, when they go to emerge, everybody comes out and they've got to be able to do that. Do you have them house to be close to a tree that they come out and they're going to hit a tree because they won't go near it? Is there ample water nearby? What kind of food do you have nearby? Because again, it not a food source they're not going to come close this one so that you guys can this is one of the bat houses out of the University of Florida yes this is called the bat large condominium literally over 50 to a hundred thousand bats can actually live in here and these would be the free tail so Brazilian free tail in Florida Mexican free tail but again, just showing you all, this is how it's structured. This isn't a little bad house. I mean, literally, I believe it is. We're not talking small. Oh, I got done and we have time to talk. <laughs> so, I like... And... University of California IPM and Bat Conservation International. They gave me a lot of information. I said back in the day, Diane Odegaard and Barbara French also work for Bat Conservation International. Diane now a, a bat rehab group in Austin, Texas. That are actually out of Florida. If you live in Florida or in Georgia, you can always reach out to them. So I also need to stay, save the thank the Texas and then some. And then I have to thank the Texas schools because it, thanks to them is why I've actually um, I've learned about that. Because again, when half of the schools in Texas, just FYI to everybody out there listening, we have 1,026 schools when 500 of them have got bats in their buildings. They taught me everything that I knew. Babies and actually having them as beneficial neighbors next to you. So, buddy.
Denny. Sorry about that. Uh, a question did come in, and this is, is there anything extra you can do as once you have bad houses up, they're correct, they're aligned, they're at the correct height? And I know you said earlier that if you don't normally have bats in the area, they're just not going to magically come. But if you did have bats in the area, is there anything else you can do? And if you don't normally, so to answer your question. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. So what you can do is if you know in talking to BCI and to a couple of people who've built the bad houses, even Laura and Thomas Finn, known to la actually lace the house with guano. They consented. Well, that's not what I was hoping was going to be the answer. She said, thank you for that. Um, anyone else have any questions? So Miss Margaret just said that her audio is failing. Yeah, it's you. You keep cutting in and out, Danny. Oh, and I'm so, I, I I apologize. It looks like we have storms rolling in, and that might be that might be part of it. You do have a thank you in the chat box and a lot of um, emails and chats here saying thank you for the pictures and that everything was great. Y'all, I'm easy to find on Google. If you just Google Janet Hurley, Texas Extension, you'll find me. I mean, if there's anything I can help anybody with, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to try and point you in the right direction, get you extra help. Because again, sometimes it, you just need someone to talk to. That's right. And one more before we go, we've got one minute and we had one question come in and they said, again, could you tell them what, what the device is that you said could be cut and attached to the house? Um, you can either use caulk tube. Again, okay, not promoting Amazon, but you can find them on Amazon Prime. It put um, bad exclusion tubes. They actually come up with those, those plastic ones, you guys. You can actually purchase those. I've, I've, I've found those in several places. But if you're into the DIY, you can take old, great old caulk tubes, clean them out. And be sure to nail, never use, never, ever, 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 ever use um, tape when you're doing bad exclusion. And one more, the yellow triangles that were on the rabies chart that you showed earlier, were those over Harris County? I don't know if you can remember. The reason we have more rabid bat reportings is because we have done such a fine job of educating a lot that we are getting more and more bats submitted. It's not that we're seeing an increase in rabies, it is because we're getting more missions. Super. Well, thank you so much. This is very informative. The pictures were awesome and the information was great. Uh, hopefully we'll see you guys again um, next month when we talk about um, insect populations and how they're affected by the, the breeding of plants. And that will be in August. Janet Hurley, thank you so much for this presentation today. You guys, we will have a wonderful weekend and stay dry. You too. See everybody next month. Thank you.